thanks very much for um, letting me just give a quick talk about um, something I've been doing. Um, so I'm currently sitting in Tamworth, which on this map is around about here. Um, I should be at Kiel, but it's closed. So, uh, so I'm going to be working from home for the foreseeable future. So let's see how that goes. Um, but anyway, I'm going to talk to you today about, um, about what we've been doing with these um, self-assembled systems, basically. As I was saying, so um, just to sort of give you a bit of background about me, um, apologies for appearing in the chat session a minute ago. Um, I'm interested in looking at um, essentially a lot of sort of different types of applied small angle scattering. I'm just going to make a laser pointer here. Um, and I've, I've basically played with a lot of different systems and I very much enjoy doing this primarily with collaborators. What I'm mainly looking at is things that self-assemble. Um, so, for example, you know, probably fairly topical at the moment because the paper just came out with Brian. Um, we're looking at making these kind of crazy structures um, with Chiba, but also, um, you know, we've, we've done things looking at more mundane things like SDS and surfactants. Um, work, which is kind of why I was interested in that um, data that was just shown. And we've, we've very recently done some measurements on zeolites and some um, organogels. OK, um, that's yet to be published. Um, um, yeah, so I'm not going to talk about that. What I wanted to do talk about today was more to do with this side of things, um, which is essentially the self-assembly of um, a sort of new class of amphiphile and how we can control it. And in particular. OK, so um, in this work, um, the main aim is basically um, producing um, one dimensional nanostructures and obviously there's two ways of doing that um one way is you can cut them up uh, from a bigger box um and of course the other way which is going to be my favorite way because i'm into molecular self-assembly is going to be building it up from from molecular sub subunits and the idea really is that that bottom-up assembly work method can be can give us a more control essentially um it's more difficult perhaps to predict and control but might be more precise uh, and there's lots of different methods that are available um, some of which are kinetically controlled others which are a bit more thermodynamically controlled my main method because I'm a surfactant chemist by training is is using this kind of solution based self-assembly method okay so you know just a quick back to school um, solution assembly uh, most famously occurs um, in detergent molecules um, surfactants and um, Obviously, these can then be used for a whole bunch of different reasons. In a surfactant, you've got a hydrophobic part, a hydrophilic part. Um, they mycelize in water or indeed in um, um, organic solvents. Um, and they form things like liquid crystalline phases like um, these two here, hexagonal phase and a lamella phase. And obviously, you know, connected to this is, of course, the fact that we can use neutron scattering, X-ray scattering to study these um, phases um, in a quite simple way because this is the sort of thing that's been done for the past 30, 40 years on these kind of materials is pretty well established. A bit more recently, people have been looking at um, sort of different type of amphiphile. Um, so where you have, um, it's a purely hydrophobic molecule, um, but it's got two parts with different solvophobicity. So um, sort of different um, um, solubility in, in particular solvents. So for example, there's a whole bunch of work been going on looking at um, um, perfluoroalkanes that are connected to alkenes. I have to get rid of my daughter. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, but <laughs> moving on from that is basically where um, I came in and I got to play with these molecules in Japan. Um, also, um, historically, when I met Brian as well. Um, and these molecules were based on um, C60, um, which had an alcohol chain attached to them. And what we found essentially was that these things um, self-assembled in solution. Uh, and as you can see, we've already got the conclusion on the slide here, but I haven't shown the data. And this is the data here. So, you know, essentially using, in this case, more like more neutron scattering, but we also did quite a lot of X-ray scattering too. Um, we were able to sort of pinpoint the various different parts of this molecule. And this is using contrast variation um, neutron scattering, which is one of the powers of neutrons that that, that I'm, I particularly use. So, you know, and you can see the three different um, aspects of um, this um, micelle, um, you know, being highlighted using the different contrasts here. So connected to this was the fact that we were able to look at how um, concentration affected this, and basically concentration makes the micelles bigger. Um, 
primarily because it's a, a greater solverphobic drive. You've got more stuff in there that's not soluble, so therefore you've got a bigger drive. That's something that seems to be the case anyway. Temperature decreases it, and I guess that's just because you've got um, more forces that are you know, tending back towards um, a uh, completely diffuse situation. We've got loads of evidence for this, not only Saxon sands, we've also got quite a bit of cryo EM and, uh, and other various types of evidence. So I, I, we can be pretty confident that these are mycelizing. Um, and we've seen similar effects in other alkyl um, aromatic or alkyl pi conjugated systems. So, you know, obviously we wanted to play a bit of a game and quite honestly, this was not by design in any way, shape or form. This was just, I had these two derivatives um, and I was running an experiment at spring eight at the time. And I noticed that this one looked a little bit opaque um, at three in the morning when I was about to run it. And I thought, well, if it's opaque, it's scattering light. So chances are you've got some bigger stuff in there. Um, this one, on the other hand, was quite, you know, see, quite transparent. Um, so this one forms micelles and clusters when, um, when you sort of just put it into, say, for example, N-hexane. This one, on the other hand, has a tendency to gel. Okay, and the gelation point is at around about room temperature. It changes with solvent. It changes the concentration, as you might expect. I mean, the concentration is required relatively high, um, but, but nevertheless, they're accessible. I mean, for example, 100 millimolar, because this is a big molecule, 100 millimolar is roughly, I think, 18 weight percent. So it's, it's pretty pretty large amounts of this stuff, but not ridiculous. Um, and so, you know, as I've said already, um, yeah, I mean, basically we, we looked at the sands in this case. Um, we also looked at the sacks above um, this T-gel. And in that case, we found the same kind of scattering profile as I showed you already for the micelles. Um, there's about five to six molecules per micelle roughly. So I can kind of cut through the micelle and give myself a picture that looks a little bit like this. Um, and, you know, that, that's pretty, pretty clear, to be honest. My cell radius is in line with about, yeah, five-ish, which seems sensible to me in terms of packing. Below that gel, however, you get these nice peaks forming. And um, as Brian will be able to identify, um, well, not, maybe not quite so clearly in this case, what we have here is um, a hexagonal phase. Um, it's not very convincing in the data I'm showing you, but just hold fire for the next slide. Uh, once again, this is a hexagonal P6MM phase. And what we've got here is, is, is columns, okay? I mean, so this scattering here is essentially coming from the edge of the columns. So we're not actually seeing any Q to the minus one from our columns because they're too big. Um, basically. So we're just seeing essentially scattering from a roughish interface, I think, there, um, that has some solvent inside it. Interestingly, we dis disappear this peak here, the 1-0 peak, um, when we when we change the contrast. And I don't fully understand this. I put forward an, an idea of a mechanism for that, which is where, um, you know, in, in these two versions, which are these two here, you kind of get... Um, a, you don't really get that main peak because you've got um, some solvent in between. And so, yeah, it's possibly a contrast effect. But nevertheless, it's an interesting one. Incidentally, in the sacks, you see both peaks, which is exactly the same as the contrast match to alkyl um, scenario. And I'm more than happy to explain what that means in more depth sort of at another time. But it's not really the, the point here, I don't think. OK, so if you've got a question, ask me. Just to back up the analysis, you've got the 1-0 peak, the 1-1 peak. You've got a very, very small sort of um, next peak. And then we can see quite a few hexagonal bumps all the way up, you know, essentially. We also see a peak for a C60, C60 spacing, which, um, you know, gives us a bit, of, um, a bit of an idea of what we've got. So really, this is the conclusion down here. Above the gelation point, we've got micelles. Below it, we've got some sort of hexagonally packed gel fiber. So it's quite, a, and if you look at the um, POM, um, which is the light microscopy sort of polarizing optical microscopy here, you can see a fiber here going all the way from about here all the way out to there. And there's quite a few that you can pick out through. There's quite a few fairly big fibers. So these fibers or fiber bundles, I think in this case, they can be pretty damn persistent. So this is something that's sort of quite, um, quite, quite structured, to say the very least. Obviously, you know, if we can take small angle scattering of it, we can measure that scattering as a function of time. And I did this with sands, but it could equally be done with sacks. Um, I just happened to have a sands beam line in front of me at the time. Um, and what we saw was essentially a transition from the micelles here, which is this kind of signal here, to the um, sac signal, which is this kind of um, Q to the minus three, Q to the minus four coming down here, 
at a peak that you get from um, from the um, from the, the sort of crystalline structure, really quick crystalline structure. Okay, um, we did this um, in a controlled manner. We slowly cooled it over the course of quite a long time, um, from about 40 degrees down to about five degrees. Um, we took SANS measurements every six minutes because obviously with SANS we're a bit limited by flux, although I wouldn't say that our sample exactly, our, our sample scat scatters pretty strongly, but nevertheless, you know, we are a bit limited. Um, but nevertheless, every six minutes was plenty to get the data we wanted. Um, we can fit the data and we can see the blue ones here are the sort of um, uh, sort of number of micelles that exist in solution um, and the red ones is, the, is essentially the intensity of the peak and you can see that after a period uh, sort of in, initial period we start seeing a peak and that peak then grows um, and you can sort of see these, these lines are guides to the eye by the way they're not fits um, but you can see that at the same time as that peak grows the number of micelles in the solution um, decreases okay now you know the fit is not perfect on this data yet i'm not 100 percent happy with it i've not published it yet so i'm not going to say that it definitely goes down for 500 um my cells per you know centimeter squared i think this is um down to sort of 150 yeah, it wouldn't be per centimeter squared it'd be more like per something else but anyway um but you know nevertheless we see a decrease in the amount of my cells at the same time as we see an increase in the peak which means that one is being consumed to make the other um, we did a bit of an Av Avrami analysis on this, um, and as you can see, basically all of the data follows the same gradient, which is approximately giving us a, a value of um, a power law of one um, in that, which you know would generally suggest we've got some one-dimensional growth, which kind of makes sense if you've got gel fibers forming, I would suggest. So everything sort of makes sense um, in this respect, and I wouldn't say it was particularly groundbreaking, but nevertheless, it's nice to see. The really cool thing about this system is because you've got these C60s kind of spaced together, you actually have a system that is photoconductive. Okay, and, and so essentially we can measure this using this thing called time resolved microwave conductivity. I did this with Osaka University in Japan when I was based there. We shoot it with a laser, it forms a charge carrier, and that charge carrier persists. Whilst that charge carrier is persistent, um, it can absorb microwaves, and so we measure the absorption of microwaves as a function of time, and we get this kind of data. So the red line here is the, just the micelles, so the isotropic state above the gelation temperature, and the gel um, is obviously you know, at, at um, 10 degrees, five degrees centigrade. Um, so that's when it's gel. And you can see a bump up in conductivity, which kind of makes sense. Um, but interestingly, that photoconductivity is not too far off of a crystalline C60 derivative that's normally used in organic solar cells. So in other words, this material, it's not only kind of fun in terms of its self-assembly properties, it's also potentially useful. You know, you can put it into, um, you, you could, if you give yourself an electron acceptor too, um, it could behave as an electron donor and then, you know, you could end up with a solar cell, um, basically. And that's actually something we're trying to do at the moment with Nottingham University, although not had any results back from that yet. But basically, Obviously, at the moment, what we've got is we've got all of our fibres lined up in a higgledy-piggledy fashion, and we did not see any type of anisotropy in this signal here. Okay. Now, if you've got a system where you have a whole bunch of wires, chances are you want the electrons to get from here to here. And so it would be quite nice if all of the fibres were pointing in the same direction. And obviously, that would then allow you to have more like a wire than I currently have. Okay. So therefore, I sort of said, well, you know, is it possible to do any better? Can we actually get this anisotropy? Um, and the answer is partially yes. <laughs> so, you know, and essentially this talk could be um, called using a head sledgehammer to crack a nut, because what we decided to do is we tried, decided to try to align this gel using the magnetic field. Um, and you know, there's this, 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 this sort of um, previous for this because um, people had already published in the research molecules like this, which have pretty similar structure to mine. So it's an alkyl part and a, a sort of pi conjugated or aromatic part in this case. Um, and these things form gels um, in butanol in this case. Um, and these authors here um, in this paper here were able to actually uh, align these gels using a magnetic field. And as you can see, they, they use quite a big magnetic field. Um, and so, you know, increasing magnet, um, increasing alignment via the bifringence, um, birefringence um, value here as a function of field strength. OK, and you can see it here, a nice pretty picture, which we all like because we can easily see what's going on. 
Obviously, mine's got a similar structure, and therefore my stupid brain decided that it'd be a good idea to try to hit this with a lot of magnetic force uh, and see if we could actually make it alive. Incidentally, in this one, we actually saw um, structures, these kind of structures they thought were most likely to describe this data. These both gave the same solid line fit to the data, so they couldn't distinguish between these two. But as you can see, in both cases, you've kind of got the molecule lying. Uh, um, I haven't actually got the field direction here. Field direction's up in this case. So in this case, you've got the field going up, and these fibers are aligning um, perpendicular to the field direction. Okay. Yeah. And so yeah, that's that's the way that's happening. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah, why do I think that mine might work? Well, we did some squid data on on the solid C sixty derivative. Solid C sixty derivative is actually mostly diamagnetic, um, as you can see here. So you know. This basically, should, this should be completely straight if it's diamagnetic material. There's a little blip in the middle, um, which we have thought might be a ferromagnetic component, but you know, I think it needs to be confirmed on a, a different instrument to be absolutely sure, because it's quite a small amount. Um, there, is some, there is some literature that says um, similar derivatives to the one I've got um, can have um, ferromagnetic properties or ferromagnetic properties, but you know, I think, yeah, we need to be doubly sure before we say anything about this. But yeah, there is a minor component that might be something else. We therefore would expect um, an isotropy in, in magnetic susceptibility in basically the same direction as, as in our alkyl anthracene. Okay, so we're kind of expecting it to align in a similar manner. And so essentially what I was expecting was that my fibers would actually align roughly parallel with the field, just because of the way the molecules are structured within that um, within that um, structure that we know already because we've already done the scattering on it. Okay, so that's the question, is it gonna happen? Um, and in order to do this, obviously we need a, um, a magnet that will work and um, you know, other, magnet, uh, other magnets are available, but we have access to this um, magnet that you can use actually um, with small angle neutron scattering. And this magnet's often used to look at um, flux lattices in, in superconductors, but equally, and more recently, it's been used quite a bit for aligning soft materials as well. Uh, it, the slightly annoying thing about this magnet is that the neutrons basically go straight down the bore um, because there's a hole at the other end of this bore that I'm kind of hovering over here. And that's where the neutrons can go. And obviously, they can't come this way. Yeah. The magnetic field is also going parallel with that. So the magnetic field goes parallel with the neutrons, which is great for superconductors, but not so good for me. And I'll explain why that is in a minute. But basically what we did was this experiment here. We worked out a way of um, controlling the temperature in the bore, and this is basically just a whole bunch of liquid nitrogen flowing through it. And if we control the flow of the liquid nitrogen, we can cool this ring here, and that can cool the bore. Um, you can see um, a wire coming out, and there's a puck at the end here, which you can't really see, but that's actually what contains our sample. So we basically put the sample inside a puck, we align the sample, then we take the sample out um, if we align it perpendicular to the field, we can take it out and measure it, or if we line it, um, oh sorry, yeah, if we line it where the, the cuvettes face on um, to the picture, then we would actually sort of see it aligned, but it would be aligned with the field and we'd be looking straight along the alignment axis. So, you know, we can do both basically, and one we can do actually online and the other we have to do offline. So I've done both of them essentially. Experimental considerations we have to think about um, beforehand. Um, we've got the sample side on in the bore. If we do that, which is kind of good because then when I take this cuvette out and put it flat face on in the beam, we should, if it's aligned in the way I expect it to, see this kind of structure here, which should give us anisotropic scattering, which should mean that we can you know, easily work out what's going on and get some sort of alignment parameter. Um, the only annoying thing about that is obviously we've got to sit the magnet off the beam and we can't look at any processes occurring in real time. Um, but that's not such a big deal. Um, obviously, the other way of doing it is to have the sample face on in the bore and the neutrons and the magnetic field are both coming this way. At that point in time, you'd expect the structure to look something like this, where all of the sort of rods are aligned, but in the direction that the neutrons are traveling. So therefore, we expect to see an isotropic scattering, probably with an increased I of Q. Um, and yeah, and I'll explain why that is in a minute because that's exactly what we did see. Um, but yeah, that's basically that. There were some other experimental difficulties. I always think it's a good idea to talk about 
issues you had whilst running experiments. Um, I mean, one of the major issues we had was that I couldn't run these in normal cuvettes and we had evaporation problems, but this was solved essentially with the use of um, aluminium foil and epoxy resin. So that was quite a good one. Um, and gave me an opportunity to draw a graph by hand in my lab diary, which I then made into Excel for here. Um, another problem we found during the experiments is that these samples had a massive memory of their alignment after being heated up again back to the sort of um, isotropic state. Now, I honestly still don't fully understand this one, but this did mean that we basically had to anneal our samples for hours and really sonicate them in order to get any repeatable results. So that was quite an interesting one. And finally, that obviously the cooling rate is going to affect things, so we had to control that. But that's not surprising, and obviously we did that. Okay, so results. Sample one, side on. Um, when we had it side on, basically we saw exactly what we expected to see. And it was really nice because we actually saw extremely anisotropic scattering. And obviously this is the extreme one with 16 Tesla field. Um, and you can see here that the sample's not perfectly um, aligned. And that's because basically when it was in the beam, the puck was slightly in line because we had to have a rod here that connected it to the thermometer. And so because of the rod being there that we pushed it in with, and there was a thermometer connected, which kind of just pulled the puck slightly, that's why you get it slightly offset. So if anyone's worried about that, that's why that is. It's very explainable. Um, but basically we're seeing massively anisotropic scattering and the sample and the fibers are aligning with the fields. There's a really nice thing about a large detector area, and I'm, I'm, you know, this is one of the benefits of, of working where I did do this experiment, is that we could also see the C60, C60 alignment in the opposite direction to the, um, to the sort of general fibre alignment. So, you know, that's perpendicular, isn't it? And you can see that peak here. Uh, and it's not the strongest peak in the world, but it's pretty clear in the detector image. So how do we quantify alignment? Um, well, um, there's multiple ways of doing that, and Brian pu published a nice paper about that. Gold standard, which we've still been talking about for several years now, um, may well be two-dimensional fitting um, of the actual detector image, but so far we've gone for the basically pretty bargain basement version of just using the um, full width or half maximum of the peak. So we can quickly and easily calculate that once we've plotted um, this data as a function of phi. Um, and so, yeah, basically you just calculate, calculate the full width of half maximum of this peak and of this peak, and they should be the same, obviously. And then, you know, if we fit that to a, to a peak function, in this case, I've chosen a Lorentzian because it worked pretty well, we can get an alignment factor out. Okay, and obviously the extent of alignment, I'd expect to be somewhat proportional to the inverse of the full width of a half maximum. Okay, so this was alignment versus field strength um, as plotted using the full width of half maximum in degrees. And as you can see, um, the peak got sharper as the field strength went up. So that kind of makes sense in my mind. Um, the alignment increased with field strength. Interestingly, we don't seem to see a saturating po point even at 16 Tesla, but that's not maybe that surprising because in the alkyl anthracene, which I've spelled wrong, sorry, anthracene work, they suggested that 50 Tesla was needed in order to saturate it which is probably a little bit more than we can get access to. Um, if you plot just a log of this versus a log of this, you can get a roughly maybe linear plot here. It's not the most linear plot I've ever seen, and it could well not be linear. But, but nevertheless, that gives us an exponent of about minus 0 0.5. So maybe full width of half maximum is proportional to 1 over the square root of b, basically. Um, I've yet to work out a model that actually explains this. Um, but I am looking in the literature for it um, and to, to try and work it out. Obviously, it's going to be a balance between the diffusion processes and the magnetic processes. So we need to factor that in. And there are some models out there. So, you know, this is still a bit of work in progress in that respect. Relaxation of alignment. Um, how long does the magnetic alignment hold after it's aligned? The answer is extremely long. As I've already indicated, even if you heat it up, it actually will persist quite for quite a long time but if you don't heat it up well the longest we checked was one and a half days but i imagine that this is going to persist for rather longer than that um, interestingly as well we checked the full width of half maximum as a function of q and found that there was relatively little difference um, depending on which peak we chose um, so it's all giving us essentially the same numbers and obviously it'd be quite nice to do the um to do the um the model fitting of this area here because that should probably also give us the similar similar sort of um, data, a similar sort of result. So finally, um, what happens when you stick the sample face on? 
Well, you see a massive increase in intensity. Uh, I say massive, it's about three or four times, but for me, that's pretty big. Um, and it focuses very much on the peaks and the, and the, the um, scattering that's come from the structure. So the background is not increased to the same extent. Okay. Um, and certainly down here, it isn't either, which is, I think, probably what you'd expect. Now, obviously, I'd like a few more data points in here, but to me, this looks like it's doing something like that. Um, again, it's not going to saturate. And again, I need to somehow fit this, but, you know, it looks like it's following a similar profile to the other one. Honestly, the reason for this is simply that, you know, as opposed to having the, the scattering um, basically evenly distributed across the entire plane, um, it's just being pushed into the detector plane and that's why you're increasing it. But it does make the idea, it, gets, it does give me the idea that if you have an, an isotropic system and you're struggling to get the intensity you want from it, maybe you could try aligning it you know, with the field, because then you might actually get um, this additional scattering that gives you a bit more to model with, provided you don't mind uh, the fact that you've um, lost the reliability of the absolute intensity. So um, just to summarize, um, so obviously we've shown that these things do self-assemble. Um, I think I've been talking about this for many years now, actually. Um, I think, you know, people believe me now. Um, Interestingly, we can make these photoconductive gels and we can align them. The alignment is extremely persistent. I don't fully understand this idea that when you make things back to my cells, they can still be realigned just by cooling without a magnetic field there, but that seems to be the case. So they seem to have a memory which uh, raises the interesting ideas of homeopathy, um, but probably isn't. <laughs> um, yes. Um, it increases with field strength, which kind of makes sense. And um, yeah, we see this increase in Q when we um, actually have it perpendicular to be. Both of these, I think, are not particularly surprising scattering um, observations, but nevertheless, it's nice to have it confirmed. Um, and certainly this might be a way, it might be something to think about if you have something that is weekly scattering. So yeah, thank you very much. And um, just to acknowledge a few people, um, I'm not gonna read out their names, but um, you know, in particular, um, Brian um, and Glenn for inviting me to um, give a talk today. So thanks very much. And I'm happy to take any questions, etc. Um, did I try to follow other solvents? Give me a second, I've got to get rid of this. Did I try to, uh, other solvents, yes. Um, basically, it's quite sensitive um, in terms of the, um, I'll just go to a slide that helps me out here. Um, you can still see my screen, can't you? Yes, thank you. Um, good. Yeah, so I mean, we tried this. So generally, it's limited to N-alkanes. Um, we tried this even in cyclohexane because I had the idea that you could easily, in cyclohexane, you can obviously um, get rid of the solvent quite in, in quite a soft way and then preserve your structure. Um, but even in cyclohexane, it doesn't work. Uh, in toluene, this, this, this molecule is very, very soluble, and it's because of this solubility of C60. So you need a solvent in which C60 is insoluble, or relatively insoluble, and the alcohol chains are, are you know, soluble in order for this solvophobic self-assembly to kind of work. And we've kind of looked at this one using isothermal titration calorimetry to get some numbers out, and it looks like it's entropically favoured, so I think it is a solvophobic push, but, you know, that's maybe a bit controversial. That's an interesting question. Um, obviously, C60 has limited fluorescence if you fluorescence if you've um if you've got uh you know um any oxygen around um but um certainly i was trying to mess around with other um pi conjugated systems um i've not i've been playing with pyrene a lot recently um unfortunately pyrene doesn't seem to i've, I've yet to find a gel of pyrene which is unfortunate um, but people certainly have done similar things using the stacking with porphyrins and um, phallocyanines. Um, you know, obviously um, those being quite interesting for enhancing um, enhancing uh, fluorescence imaging, for example. Yeah, um, and anthracene. Obviously, I, I don't know exactly why they were doing the whole anthracene with the alcohol chains attached in the work that I was talking about. Um, that's this one here. Um, but yeah, I'm guessing they were doing it for similar things. And obviously that would be pretty fluorescent. Yeah. But yeah, I think that'd be very interesting. Um, I've taken myself down a slightly different avenue with the fluorescent stuff, to be honest. It's more talking about looking at liquids. 
how would you connect these C65 to an electron acceptor structure to form your, um, it's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I had a crazy idea of basically, um, if you have a preformed um, P-type polymer, such as P3HT, um, you could kind of flow my material into it. Um, because obviously if you had it at 40 degrees, it's, it, it's very, very non-viscous. And then you could cool it down and make the gel. And, you know, if you did all that in a magnetic field too, then obviously you could have it aligned as well. So I think there's stuff you can do there um, and mess around with, um, but it requires the technology to do it. Um, yeah, um, I think, um, yeah, I think, I think generally speaking, the C60 is going to act as an N-type um, within this context probably but yeah it's been we're currently doing some stuff with nottingham um who are trying to use their electron acceptors with this molecule to try to see if they can get something that has interesting solar cell activity but like i say yet to yet to have any data from that so hopefully something soon and the idea of an in liquid solar cell is still very controversial <laughs> yeah we did yeah um I have a, I did have a slide on it. Uh, we, we did mess around. I got rid of the slide, unfortunately. I can, I can go and get it. Give me a minute. So this, this is what we tried first. Uh, it wasn't a permanent magnet. It was, um, it was an electromagnet. Um, but basically we tried it using ice cubes um, above and below the sample and then ran to the SACS um, setup that we had, uh, that Brian was using at, at, at um, in Japan, in um, National Institute of Materials Science, uh, and actually saw alignment at that point in time. And that's really what gave us an idea that this would probably work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but obviously, using ice cubes is not the best control over temperature. <laughs> and it was a really humid day as well. It was a bit of a nightmare, really. It was fun, though. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh